You're listening to an Ono Media podcast. Good morning, and thanks for joining me for Rise and Crime, your morning caffeine hit all about crime. I'm Mama Jules, and last week it was Oklahoma. Today, it's Michigan. I've got two stories from the Great Lakes State, and we will start with an attorney who used his profession to write himself into the will of a jewelry store owner, and then he had the jewelry store owner murdered. 39-year-old lawyer Marco Bisbikis worked for 47-year-old Dan Hutchinson and his wife Marissa. Okay, see, among many, many, many business deals and legal document creation, Marco, the lawyer, well, he was holding some jewelry and cash for Dan that was possibly illegally obtained or at least obtained without filing taxes. Dan has some big time clients. There's rappers, there's athletes, and there's entertainers. And these customers, well, they don't always want their names tied to the purchases they make. So Dan was willing to allow cash purchases for jewelry that could not be tracked. This made him very popular and very wealthy. And these potential misdeeds apparently led Marco to believe that he could alter Dan's trust, making himself the heir to Dan's millions. And then, if he could kill Dan and Marissa, he would be one rich man. Marco organized this trust in early 2022, and when it came time for Dan and Marissa to sign the papers to legalize the trust, they didn't read them. They believed that Marco had set the trust up the way that they had discussed. But Marco slyly made himself a third person on the trust. And Marissa said she had no idea and neither did her husband, Dan. They just dutifully signed the papers. But once Marco decided to kill Dan and Marissa for the millions, he couldn't just do it himself. So he gathered some of his unsavory acquaintances and told them a tale. Angelo Raptolis and Darnell Larry. I'm really sorry, Angelo, if I said your last name wrong. Well, they were recruited by Marco. He told them that Dan, who honestly did have some questionable clients and practices, he said Dan had cut a deal to testify against members of the mafia. He said Dan was being threatened with charges by federal authorities and that he volunteered information to those feds in order to save himself. Now, Marco told the two unsavory fellows, Darnell and Angelo, that he needed their help to kill Dan because the mafia was pressuring Marco to stop Dan from testifying. All right, did you follow all of that? In this made-up story, Marco is going to be in trouble with the mafia if he doesn't kill Dan because Dan needs to be dead so that he doesn't testify against the mafia. And his made-up story worked. Darnell recruited his cousin Roy during a Memorial Day barbecue. And I was just thinking, how does that conversation go? At our family get-togethers, we're talking about the hype surrounding Taylor Swift or stupid HOAs or teasing competitions on which one of my kids is the funniest. But at this barbecue, they're soliciting a family member to kill someone. Now, Darnell, he allegedly begged his cousin Roy to do the killing because Darnell didn't want to go back to prison. And Roy, well, he somehow felt some sympathy for his cousin, and he agreed to do the killing. But that killing wasn't going to be done for free and out of the goodness of Roy's heart. He wanted Darnell to give him his prized Camaro in return for the hit job. Now, the deal was sealed, and just a few days later, on June 1st of 2022, Darnell and Roy staked out Dan and his wife, Marissa. Okay, see, Dan and Marissa, they didn't just own a jewelry store. They also recently purchased a pawn shop. And that pawn shop deal was brokered by Marco, the lawyer, and was purchased with the money that hadn't been tracked by the government. Well, Roy and Darnell tracked Dan and Marissa's car to that pawn shop. When Dan and Marissa exited the pawn shop, Roy and Darnell began telling them. But get this, Roy is on an electric bike. He's been circling the pawn shop, which has surveillance cameras, so he is seen many times on video riding that electric bike. Dan and Marissa didn't get very far after they left the pawn shop because a potential customer flagged them down. So they pull over and stop. And while Dan and Marissa are talking with the customer, their friend and employee, Alex, 
Well, he pulls up on the driver's side window of Dan's car. So like, think this through. We have witnesses. We have Alex and the potential customer, and we have surveillance footage of this whole entire scene. But this doesn't stop Roy. He pulls up to the car on his electric bike and begins shooting into the driver's side window. Roy fired 14 shots. Six of those shots hit Dan and one shot hit Marissa in the leg and Dan dies from his wounds. But Marissa, she lives, which isn't accomplishing what Marco the lawyer wanted. Marissa can't live. If she lives, he doesn't get the money. But the made up scheme was about Dan being the target. So I'm just kind of guessing Roy maybe thought he was doing a bang up job when he got rid of Dan. Well, after shooting 14 times, Roy took off on his electric bike. But remember that employee who was parked right near Dan's car? Well, he took off after Roy, slamming into the back of him and injuring Roy's ankle. And that's when 911 was called and Dan was pronounced dead and Roy was arrested at the hospital. And pretty quickly, the whole scheme fell apart for the cousins Roy and Darnell, and also for Marco, and then the fourth accomplice, Angelo. Marissa recovered from her injury, and she told police all she knew. She had to cut her own deal of immunity because she and Dan were completely innocent in their business dealings. And then all three men were arrested and charged with varying crimes. Marco and Roy, so Roy's the gunman, Marco's the lawyer. Well, they were each charged with first-degree premeditated murder, conspiracy to commit first-degree premeditated murder, and assault with intent to murder and felony firearm charges. Now, it took nearly two years for Marco and Roy to plead their case before a jury, and they did so over the last couple of weeks. And one of the defendants took the stand, which we don't see very often. When Larry took the stand, he testified that he did have a criminal past that included drug charges back in 1997, but he told the jury that he was not a killer. He also claimed he hadn't seen his cousin Darnell in 35 years prior to that barbecue before the murder. He said the following, I never talked to this brother a day in my life about a murder. I never spoke to this brother, never had a conversation about what was going on. Now, Roy said he went to Darnell's home and he was making food on the grill and that was it. He said he left a pair of gloves at Darnell's, which caused him to return to Darnell's home on June 1st. Okay, remember, that's the day of the murder. He said while he was there, he got a title to a car that he was buying from Darnell. Or maybe he got a title to a Camaro that he might've received as a payment. Now, Roy said that while he was visiting Darnell, The two got in his car and drove to a safe deposit box to get the title. Roy then said he asked his cousin to drop him off in the neighborhood near the pawn shop because he wanted to buy some weed there. He said while he was walking, he was hit by a car and that the man driving the car got out and pulled a gun on him. He said a mail carrier was nearby and that mail carrier called 911 in order to help Roy. Well, when police arrived on the scene of the accident, Roy said he was questioned and arrested for the murder of Dan. And he denied riding an electric bike. Okay, remember, there is video footage of him circling the pawn shop on that electric bike. Roy also denied on the stand, knowing any of the other players in this saga. And you guys, that part might actually be true. It might be the only honest thing he said. He might not have known Marco back then or Angelo or Dan or anyone else associated with these men who blurred the legal lines. Roy then went on to call his cousin Darnell a compulsive liar. And he said the man in the video evidence is not him. He then told the jurors that he wouldn't have botched the plan as bad as this plan was botched. He said if he had had a job to kill both Dan and Marissa, he would have completed the job. Roy also denied that a photo from other surveillance footage showed him in Darnell's car. He admitted that the clothes the man was wearing in the car were his, or at least looked like his, but he said that he wasn't the man in the photo. And he said that the man in the photo and on the bike footage had different tattoos, and they seemed to weigh more than Roy weighs. Well, the trial had a moment of battle of the cousins, Because Darnell, 
who took a plea deal and agreed to testify, well, he took the stand and he testified to his loyalty to Marco, the lawyer. He said he would have died for Marco. And that was why he worked diligently to get Dan murdered because he hated snitches and he would protect Marco to the death. He said he was offered $50,000 to orchestrate the killing of Dan and that the money came from the mafia, or at least that's what Marco had told him. Now, Angelo, he also took a plea deal and agreed to testify at the trial against Marco and Roy. Angelo talked about how hard it was to testify against Marco because he felt like a brother to him. He said the two were raised together and that they were even God brothers in their religion. He relayed the scheme that involved the mafia and Dan's potential testimony to the feds. And he said he believed all of what Marco had told him. And he said he knew Marco would not turn on him. He was his closest ally. And he knew Marco would only ask him for this favor if he was truly in trouble. So he took on the task of getting Marco out of this sticky situation. And he turned to Darnell. And Darnell turned to Roy. He then testified that Marco said some opportunities to kill Dan had already been squandered. So they needed to get it done. ASAP. He said he was sleeping on the morning of the killing, but he was awoken and summoned to Marco's office to deal with the fumbled killing that had happened just a few hours earlier. He also testified that Marco called an attorney friend to help Roy, who was now arrested for the murder. Now, Angelo said that Marco then told him to hit the streets and start asking around about what people were saying about Dan dying. You know, so possibly they could craft the best possible story. Angelo then testified that Marco had told him they needed to complete the job and that Marissa would need to die. She had seen too much at the scene of Dan's murder. Well, the new murder for hire plot for Marissa, well, it included Darnell using Dan's cash and jewelry that were stored at Marco's office. Darnell took a picture of the cash and used it to recruit a new hitman. Now, obviously, that never materialized, but Angelo testified to the plan. Well, during the trial, 22 witnesses took the stand. The state also presented loads of video surveillance footage that was obtained from various cameras. Now, that footage showed moments both before and after the shooting. Well, both lawyers for Roy and Marco, they said police used questionable tactics when they were developing the murder cases against their clients. They said the state threatened Darnell with a death sentence if he didn't cooperate and testify against Marco and Roy. Now, Marco's attorney, he also called the trust that Marco developed for Dan and Marissa. Well, he said that trust could be altered at any time and that the motive just didn't exist for Marco to obtain the money. Now, Marco's lawyer also said there would be no reason for Marco to kill the goose that had laid the golden egg. He said that Marco was getting rich off of working with Dan, so why would he ruin the, that ability to continue making money? Now, the jury, they deliberated for less than a day before finding both men guilty of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. When the jury's findings were read in court, Roy nodded in what seemed to be resignation, and Marco, well, he sat emotionless looking directly forward. Both men will be sentenced on June 12th. They face up to life in prison. Now, for his testimony, Angelo has been sentenced to serve four years in prison, and he started that prison sentence in August of 2022 when he told cops everything. He should be out in about two years. And Darnell, well, he was sentenced to six years in prison. He has served about two of those years. So there is one player left unaccounted for. That's Philip Sumter. We haven't even talked about him yet. He aided in hatching the scheme and his case is set for trial later this year since he didn't take a plea deal. Dan was married to Marissa for 16 years, but the two had been together for 23 years. They had one daughter named Marley. When I tried to visit the website for the jewelry store, the link is busted and I'm not sure if it's still in business anymore. I'm just left hoping that Marley, Dan and Marissa's daughter, can live a full life. And now on to our next Michigan story. 
So let's learn the details of how six people were involved in a catfishing scheme that led to the death of 23-year-old Kayla Sadowski from Monroe, Michigan. Kayla, who was a member of the Saginaw Chippewa tribe, was at one point dating an older man. And older by a bit. Kayla was in her early 20s when they were together. And Stephen Bells, that older man, well, he was in his early 40s. The relationship ended. But the beef between Stephen and Kayla and even their mutual friends, well, it never really ended. The group and Kayla had several disagreements. And police believe those disagreements are what led Stephen and his new wife, 25-year-old Narina Bells, I got to pause here because, yes, he does clearly have an age preference. Well, Stephen and his wife, Narina, and her friend, 24-year-old Sierra Bemis, and another friend, 27-year-old Alexander Fecco, well, they all worked together to catfish Kayla and eventually kill her. Okay, this group of Stephen, Narina, Sierra, and Alexander, well, they recruited Bryn Smith, that's another friend, to pretend to be interested in dating Kayla. And Bryn and Kayla, they started communicating through Facebook with flirtatious messages. And after a bit, Bryn scheduled a date with Kayla. On February 15th of 2023, Bryn picked Kayla up and the two drove to an abandoned Boysville facility that used to serve as a juvenile detention center. When they arrived, Stephen and Sierra were waiting for Kayla. Stephen shot Kayla three times with a handgun One of those shots being point blank through the top of Kayla's skull. And then they left Kayla there. During the murder, Narina, she's the wife, well, she was at the apartment listening to a police scanner so that she could notify her husband quickly if police were on their way to the crime scene. After the group met back up following the execution of Kayla, they kind of rethought the concept of leaving Kayla's dead body out in the open of the abandoned juvenile center. So they returned to the scene of the crime and they wrapped Kayla's body in a tarp, adding some fragrances to the body in hopes of covering up the smell of decomposition. They then stuffed the body under a door. Well, it did take two weeks, but on March 2nd of 2023, someone exploring the dilapidated building stumbled upon the body and called Michigan State Police. And as we all know, If you have six people involved in a murder, it really doesn't take long for criminals to start turning on each other. When the body was found, the various players scattered to different states, trying to outrun the evidence. But through technology, the MSP gathered evidence, and their first arrest, the husband-wife duo, Stephen and Irina, well, they were charged with open murder and conspiracy to commit homicide. They were tracked down in North Carolina and then expedited back to Michigan. And then others were arrested. Sierra, Bryn, okay, remember, he's the guy who did the catfishing, and another woman, Kaylin Ramsey. Well, they were all arrested and charged with open murder and conspiracy to commit homicide. It was Alexander Fecco who fared just a little bit better. He was charged with three counts of accessory after the fact since he was the one who got rid of the murder weapon. Now, people started taking plea deals. Of course, that's going to happen. And Stephen, the gunman, well, he was the first of the six to face a jury trial in March of this year. The eight-day trial included testimony from Stephen's very own wife. That's right, Norena testified as part of her plea deal. Sierra and Alexander, they also testified against Stephen as part of their plea deals. During the trial, two reasons for the killing were revealed. And like I said before, Stephen and then the group by proxy had beef with Kayla. But it also seems that Stephen committed the murder as some sort of sick wedding present to his wife, Narina. Stephen didn't testify at his trial, and his defense attorneys didn't call a single witness. Stephen was found guilty, and on Thursday, he was sentenced to life in prison. For her plea deal, Narina was sentenced to 13 to 30 years in prison for second-degree murder. Okay, Sierra, remember she was the one at the scene? She received a slightly longer sentence of 18 years to 30 years in prison. And Alexander, who was charged with lighter felonies, received 5 to 10 years in prison. Judge Daniel White told the three who cut plea deals that they should have alerted someone to the ridiculous plan and that since they didn't do that, their sentences would be harsher. 
The judge also laid out various times in the plan where they could have changed course, yet they didn't. He told the three that any time someone tells you to dress all in black to participate in a misdeed, it's time to put the brakes on. Alexander's attorney had asked for leniency since his client was the, quote, cleanup man, and that his client was also the first to offer testimony for a plea deal. But the judge was not sympathetic to the attorney's requests. And the judge felt Sierra should receive a slightly longer sentence because she operated as the lookout while the murder occurred. All right, so we have sentenced four people, but there were six involved. The other two, Bryn, the 21-year-old who lured Kayla, and Kaylin, who was involved peripherally in the murder, well, they both went to trial in April. And both were found guilty after only one hour of jury deliberations. Those two will be sentenced on May 30th. Kayla left behind her son, Ryan, and her mother, Paulette. She also had two sisters and one brother. She enjoyed camping and being outside. And her obituary also says she loved the anime art form. Now, let's end with this fishy story. At the end of last year, Charlotte Russ and her children took a trip to Pismo Beach. Pismo Beach is in the central coast of California, and it's part of a five smaller city cluster that's right there along the beach. Well, in the mid-1950s, clams could be found in abundance on the beaches of Pismo, and the city even adopted the name Clam Capital of the World. But in 2024, the city no longer uses the adopted name because over-harvesting by humans, and also by protected sea otters, Well, it's made the availability of clams very slim. When Charlotte's kids began searching for seashells along the seashore, they thought they had hit pay dirt when they scooped up exactly 72 shells that seemed to be discovered in rows on the beach. It was then that Charlotte was approached by an officer from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. He informed Charlotte that her children were harvesting clams without a license. He wrote her a ticket, and she gathered up her children to leave the beach. That's when she opened the ticket and read that her fine was $88,000. She told KFSN that the ticket made her really depressed, and it kind of ruined the family's trip. Um, Yeah, that would ruin a trip. But Charlotte's life got drastically better after she went before a San Luis Obispo County judge. The judge agreed to reduce her fine to $500. Charlotte says she can now look back and have a chuckle at what she experienced. She even commemorated the event by getting a tattoo of a shellfish with a flower, just a reminder of the crazy adventure. She said she wished there were more signs posted so that she and her family and others wouldn't mistakenly dig up the clams. And with a little digging, I found that clams can grow to be about four inches in size, but they take somewhere between 10 to 14 years to get to that size. And in 2024, clams on Pismo Beach aren't getting much bigger than three inches right now due to the over-harvesting. And the California Department of Fish and Wildlife can fine you anywhere from $100 to $1,000 per offense or per clam that you dig up without a license. Last year, 58 citations were issued for illegal clam digging. And this programming note, the defense has rested in the Chad Daybell murder trial. As of Friday, the state was recalling rebuttal witnesses, but they assured the judge that they would only be calling three to four rebuttal witnesses. So what does this mean? Well, the jury should get the case later this week. Court is off today because of the Memorial Day holiday, so the state will resume on Tuesday. And that means closing arguments could be Wednesday and Thursday, potentially. Well, that's your Monday episode of Rise and Crime. If you're coming to the live show for Murder With My Husband in Salt Lake City, please make sure you say hi. It's been so fun to meet up with so many listeners. And if you're watching on YouTube, please drop a comment and like and subscribe. And if you so feel inclined, I'd love if you'd subscribe and follow the podcast on all of the various platforms. Please leave a five-star review. It truly is appreciated and it helps rise in crime and 
really all of the other Oh No Media podcasts get bigger and stronger. You can join me again on Thursday for more morning crime news. I'm Mama Jules and keep safe out there.